The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. questions you always had, the answers you were never given, the place to seek the truth. Welcome to Veritas. Greetings to everyone around the world, and a warm welcome to another edition of Veritas at VeritasRadio.com. I'm your host, Mel Fabregas, and I sincerely thank you for joining me once again. And if this is your first time or your truth journey brought you here, welcome home. And to listen to tonight's full interview, you know what to do by now. Just go to VeritasRadio.com and subscribe. You are what keeps us alive. You'll get your login immediately and you'll be able to listen to hundreds of hours of truth. And to upgrade your life like I have upgraded mine, go to sanitasradio.com and listen to what we have to offer there. Two radio programs, great information. And if you want to get in touch with me, you want to be a guest on this show, have a guest suggestion, or simply have feedback, I always love to hear from you. Click on the contact button of our website. Let me begin this interview by stating that I have no attachment to the flat earth. I have no attachment to the oblate spheroid and even to this fear. If our home is any of these, so be it. I wouldn't be surprised of any. What I continue to be surprised and suspicious of are the people who continue attacking those who simply ask questions. I recently attended a conference that deals with the most open-minded topics you could possibly imagine. However, when it comes to the flat earth topic, it was a no-no. Look, I can't say I blame people for thinking this is the most absurd topic under the sun, or the firmament rather, but you open-minded people who discuss aliens, UFOs, reptilians who ruled the world, Bigfoot, and the rest of it, why do you continue telling us to stop looking into this? Those of you who study the pyramids and ancient civilizations, you venerate these ancient ones. And rightfully so. And some of these very ancient ones believed the earth was flat. Why do you then continue looking into their achievements if the notion of a flat earth is so absurd and it's what they believed? And those of you who continue writing to me saying the ancient ones knew they lived on a sphere, how did they know? Just because you see a sphere above you doesn't prove you are standing on a sphere. You can still play pool on a flat table and basketball on a flat court. At any rate, I digress. Today's special guest is a veteran of this program, so he doesn't need a formal introduction. Directly from Bangkok, Thailand, I'd like to welcome Eric Dubay. Hello, Eric, and welcome back to Veritas. Hey, Mel. It's great to be back here. I love your show. Always, always a pleasure having you back, and I'm I'm glad that we're still talking after a year. Uh, A lot of people that I know have stopped talking about this because they just can't sustain, they just can't endure the attacks that they continue to receive from, from people from all over the world. But I have to tell you, some of the smartest people I know are discussing this in silence. Why do you think that is? Yeah, well, like you said... A lot of people don't want to touch this subject with a 10-foot pole, and a lot of those same people are the ones espousing aliens and UFOs and Bigfoots and all the other unprovable conspiracy theories out there, whereas Flat Earth is a easily provable conspiracy fact, which blows away all of these other theories out of the water. Aliens, the spinning ball Earth, evolution, dinosaurs a whole range of other things start to be blown out of the water when you realize the flat earth truth. And so this is when a lot of, uh, what a lot of truth seekers don't want, uh, us going down this rabbit hole because that does away with their paradigm. People like David Icke and his reptilians on the hollow moon. You can't have those if the moon is a translucent 
light, just a disc Im- uh, immaterial that you can't land on, or Michael Tessarian's uh, Atlantean progenitor aliens from Tiamat or whatever, all these these supposed truthers that have their own myths woven based on things like aliens and the, the spinning ball planets and the infinite universe with infinite galaxies and all these supposed potential uh, alien life that we have out there. A lot of their research goes down the tubes if the flat earth truth comes out. So there's a lot of resistance being met, both from the mainstream sheeple who've been taught that flat earth is something to be ridiculed and ridiculous, uh, all the way to the alternative, whose narratives fall by the wayside if the flat earth truth is discovered. So the alternative alternative media is picking up the slack here, bringing the real truth. That's what we're trying to do. Alternative, 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 I guess. <laughs> it's four, probably four or five layers. But another thing that, that's not that it bothers me, but I see this a lot. A lot of people who write to me and say, Mel, you're just wasting your energy. There are so many other important things that we should be discussing. And we do, folks. We've had Eric last year. We've had, you know, a few other people. We have Jeffrey Grupp coming in a few days. These are people that I've had before who are talking about this, and I think we should listen. But why do they continue to say, we have so many other problems? Why are you focusing on this distraction? Hmm. Well, if they haven't looked into it at all, I can see how they would think that way. And I kind of thought that way years ago as well, that, well, it's just the shape of the Earth. What does that matter? Does it really matter whether it's this shape or that shape? So if you think of it on that level, then sure, it seems insignificant, and it seems like it could be a waste of time, even if it was true. But if you think of it a little deeper than that, and you think of it as being the most fundamental lie, is where we are, what we're doing here, the earth beneath our feet, uh, the lights in the sky above us, what they actually are. And if we've been lied about all of these as well as the Big Bang and evolution and the way that we supposedly got here and the purpose we may or may not have in this nihilistic cosmology that they've presented with us, it becomes a big deal. And when you look at the potential for a truth like this, a truth that has been suppressed for 500 years now, the Flat Earth truth, if that gets out and it is shown that every government, every university, Every pundit, every television station is lying knowingly and censoring this this truth. What happens when it actually gets out? The kind of restructuring of society and the system that truthers are looking for, that people know we need, is what can happen and what will happen and what must happen if this truth gets out. Because this is huge. It is the truth. I guarantee anyone who's never heard of this before, look into the flat earth. The earth is flat, just like it appears on the horizon. The earth is motionless, just as you feel motionless. Everything in the sky revolves around us, just as it appears if you look up and use your own eyes, your own senses. Everything that your senses tell you is what's happening. But you've been fed a false system. You've been shown CGI images with a ball earth with a horizon that curves. You've been shown more CGI images with a ball earth that spins. You've been shown planets that spin like billiard balls around each other in many different directions at many different speeds simultaneously. You've been shown all these things in CGI format. You've had Freemasons lie to you and tell you they've seen it for themselves, but you've never seen it for yourself. You've just been lied to and shown pictures, and you believe those. It's not science. Science, in fact, shows that the Earth is flat and motionless. And there are hundreds upon hundreds of proofs and experiments that have been repeated throughout history for hundreds of years, but you haven't been taught them in school because they don't want you to be taught that in school. They show you a spinning globe on your first day and tell you that gravity keeps water and buildings and people stuck to the bottom of that thing. And they repeat it until you believe it, your parents believe it, your grandparents believe it. 500 years ago, people were believing it. They even started trying to get people to believe it thousands of years ago, but it didn't pass until about Copernicus in the 1500s when people really started, when this really started to, to take shape. So 
the, the reason that some of the pseudo truthers, so to speak, or just mainstream sheeple, uh, don't want this to get out and say that it's a distraction is because they don't know how far reaching the implications of a truth this deep actually surfacing would be. It's like holding a, a balloon underwater. When you let go, that thing's just going to rush to the surface. The water's going to go flying. And that's, that's what we need. It's exactly what we need. So, um, that's what I'm working towards doing. In doing what I do, Eric, uh, you become a lightning rod, and I'm sure you have become a lightning rod, too. So here's another message I received recently from someone who says he's a he has studied ancient civilizations, and he says they knew that the earth was round. So, of course, I asked him, can you can you prove to me that they said that? Well, you know, they could get on top of the pyramids and see that every time they would get on higher steps, they could see farther and farther. What does this have to do with the flat, the, the round earth, if that's just perspective. Right. Yeah. Neil deGrasse Tyson was just on the Anthony Cumia show saying how at the Burj Khalifa tower in Dubai, if you go to the top of it, the sun sets uh, two minutes later than at the bottom. And that <laughs> proves that the earth is a ball. Uh, so they're, what they're saying is they're saying that the earth is a ball and the curved shape of the horizon is what's the, the sun is disappearing beyond that. And if you go up in the, the tower, you'll see the sun again for two more minutes and watch it set again. And that's proof that it's setting beyond a ball. Yet, if you go up there and you take video 360 degrees around you, you'll see the horizon's perfectly flat all the way around you, perfectly at eye level, and it rose with you at eye level right from the base of that tower to the top of that tower, as is only possible on a flat plane, a ball, no matter how big the ball is, the horizon would stay where it is, and you'd have to tilt your head looking down more and more as you rose to see it. And of course, it would also curve. The reason that you see the sunset slightly later from a higher position is simply perspective uh, on flat surfaces. If you rise even higher than that, then it, you'll see even farther as well. They don't seem to mention that. When you go higher in altitude, you're able to see further along a flat plane. And that's all that's happening as you go higher. So the sun, when it's setting, is actually maintaining its altitude at about 3,000 miles above us. And it circles over and around the flat Earth. And so from your position, due to perspective, as it goes away from you, just like a row of street lamps as they're going away from you, the one closest to you seems very high overhead and then slowly dips down more and more to the horizon. Or just like a long, narrow hallway where the floor rises up, the ceiling comes down, and the two walls come into a point right in the middle. That pyramid shape, that eye at the top of the pyramid, another, another reason for that symbol is that's the way that our eyes actually see. Our eye sees in a pyramid-type shape like that, and the sun setting down on the horizon like that is simply an element of perspective. And when it goes beyond the horizon, it's not setting beyond the curvature of a ball Earth. It's simply gone beyond the vanishing point of perspective from your point of view, which is what the horizon line is. It is not the curvature of the Earth, as you've been taught. You can think about it. If if the limit of your perspective was the curvature of the Earth, and you saw, say, a ship disappearing over it, then you look to the left, the same amount of distance, and you look to the right, the same amount of distance, well, there's no curvature there, but that's twice the distance as the uh, ship in front of you that you think has disappeared beyond the curvature. And then to double-check this, you can take out a pair of binoculars, and you'll see that that ship that disappeared beyond the horizon over the curvature of the Earth, magically comes right back totally into view, hull and all. And that's because it's simply gone beyond your perspective, which you can bring back into view with technology or by gaining altitude, like by going up in a tower. So this is all just an element of perspective, and tricky Masonic magicians are trying to get you to think it's based on the curvature of their spinning ball earth when it's nothing but perspective. It was uh, December 7th, 1972, where we saw the quote-unquote blue marble, the image taken by allegedly Apollo 17. But 
I've always had a problem with that picture, not with that picture, that photograph in particular, but because of so many new ones have made its way to me and they're all so different. The United States looks so much bigger now. Africa looks so much smaller now. What's happening? Are the, the tectonic plates changing so much that when we take pictures now, the land mass has changed or is it just pure CGI all along? <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, the tectonic ch changes are causing the CGI pictures to become very different as the <laughs> years <kidding>. go on. <laughs> no, that's a good point. Take a look at these images coming from NASA and, and RASA and JAXA and, and all these different space agencies, the, uh, the Chinese, the Japanese, some of these are even worse than NASA, and you'll notice how clearly fake they are, how obviously Photoshop CGI they are. And when you compare them to one another, you'll notice these impossibilities like the water always being different shades of blue every single picture. The size of continents changing from picture to picture, one time North America filling up the entire picture, one time it being just a tiny little speck on the upper part. You'll have on the uh, animations, you'll notice that the clouds almost never move. You'll see a spinning ball Earth with the exact same cloud formations for 24 hours. Um, take a look at these anomalies, not only on the pictures of the Earth, but on the pictures of the moon because we've never been to the moon either. NASA's moon landing hoax is all about going far enough away, supposedly, that they could turn around and take a picture of this spinning ball Earth they've been talking about for 450 years and say, hey, we were right, look at that. And the raging debate that had been going on since the late 1800s from Samuel Robotham and the other flat earthers then was almost in an instant put to rest by this so-called photographic evidence in an age where most people believed we went to the moon because they heard it on the radio. Nowadays, we have computers, we have uh, Photoshop, we can see these things. You can see anomalies in the original NASA images just by putting them into Photoshop. For instance, you will see many of the images of Earth supposedly taken from the moon have artifacts rectangular artifacts around the earth in directly in embedded in the image proving that the the image of the earth was actually cut and pasted in a computer program and put there that way otherwise there there wouldn't be a rectangular splotch of blackness around the earth in space there's also uh images where you can see the shadow of a ceiling above the rover as it's taking off from the moon because it's simply being lifted by a crane overhead in a studio. Many of these things, these have all been exposed. This is, this is common knowledge amongst us educated conspiracy folk that you like to ridicule and laugh at and call stupid flat earthers. But this is just a fact. You can't land on the moon. There's nothing to land on. It's just a light. And I can prove it to you right now. Go out on any afternoon and look at the moon, you'll see the blue of the sky through the part of the moon that isn't illuminated, proving that it couldn't be a solid sphere to land something on, but that it's just a light and you can see through it. People have photographed stars through the moon. You can see the blue of the sky through the moon during any waxing and waning cycle. You can see for yourself that it's, it's a light. And it's casting its own light, unlike they tell us that it's a reflector of the sun's light. You can prove that its light is different from the sun's light. It's cold. If you take a thermometer and put it in the shade and another thermometer and put it in the direct moonlight, it's actually colder in direct moonlight and the thermometer will go up in the shade, the exact opposite of the sun. It's like the yin yang. If you picture the yin yang symbolism, in, in Chinese astrology, it's the sun and the moon circling around the flat, around and over the flat earth. The, the yin and yang is everywhere in nature. In fact, the male, female, inhale, exhale, good, evil, up, down. But they do away with these things. They say there is no up and down, that everything's just relative. They say there is no good and evil, that they're all about moral relativity. They say there is no sun and moon yin-yang aspect 
because the sun is actually really, really big and really, really far away, and the moon is really small but a bit closer. And from our faulty perspective, it just looks like they're exactly the same size in the sky. Once again, Masonic magicians lying to you so that you don't believe your own eyes, which tell you that the sun and the moon are equal, divine, balanced opposites in the sky, revolving over and around us, keeping time like a celestial clock and calendar. But instead, they just feed you these lies about spinning billiard balls, doing wobbling and tilting on their axis, doing all this nonsense to try and explain away all the bullshit that they're telling you. Everything you've heard, you've been taught about the ball earth, all this wobbling and the tilting back and the spinning around the sun and the sun spinning around the galaxy, all these things, the, the ships disappearing over the horizon, these are all myths that you've been taught since school to weave in your head the idea that you do live on a spinning ball, even though there actually is no experimental evidence nor no sensory evidence to make you think think that just teachers and NASA and textbooks and nonsense. <laughs> you know, I, I something that has bothered me also is when I see the sun the sun setting or the moon closer to the horizon. If the sun is ninety three mile, million miles away, why is it that it looks so big at the horizon level, just like the moon looks at the horizon level, almost the same size all the time eat to each other? That's right. They appear to be almost the same size at all times. It does change, and the changes are mostly due to the atmosphere. So I can show you a picture of the sun setting in the desert where it's very dry, and you'll see the sun shrink and shrink into a tiny, tiny pinprick before it disappears into the horizon. And then I can show you another video of on a more over the ocean, say, on a more humid day, the sun is going to actually expand a little bit due to the atmosphere and then disappear into the horizon like a big ball, as, as many people have seen it. But either way that it disappears, whether it disappears into a pinprick before leaving the horizon or it expands and, and goes down the horizon, it's simply moving away from your perspective, as we talked about. It's not actually going down, just like a row of street lamps aren't getting shorter and shorter as they get farther and farther away from you. It's just an element of perspective. Any, anything operates this way. I wonder if we called a railroad... Um, the, the, the actual rails, the manufacturer, if we asked them, do you factor in the curvature of the earth when you make them? And the answer is no. No, no they don't. Canals, tunnels, railways, they do not have bridges. They don't have to factor in the curvature of the earth. The uh, what, what bridges of the Golden Gate or the Pont punch lane bridge I've, i heard people say that yeah they had they say they factored in two inches for the curvature of the earth that's one of the only ones i've ever heard people claim that they've they factored in curvature but even the suez canal and all these different canals railways they admit that there's uh, no fa no um, allowance given for curvature uh, there's quotes in flat earth books for centuries uh, from surveyors and engineers uh, attesting to this so, and of course that two inch one is a joke because the, the bridge is so long that the actual supposed curvature on their 25,000 mile circumference ball earth would be, I can't remember now, but many, many, many feet and not just two inches. So they yeah. can't even get, get their fake math right when they try to pretend that they factor in curvature. If we are spinning at 1,000 miles per hour, should most of the water, our, our oceans cover the equator? Why is it that instead most landmass appears close to, you know, to the equator? Shouldn't water be around the equator? Take a wet tennis ball and spin it. I guarantee you, folks, most of the water will move to the middle of the equator. Right. Yeah, their, their idea of a spinning ball and the actual alignment of things on the Earth doesn't fit too well. They, they try to say that it's, a, it's an oblate spheroid, and that, that's to silence people that have objections like yours. Then show oh, me a, a picture, show me a photograph of the oblate spheroid. Oops, oops, all our pictures are spheres. We'll, we'll get right on that. And then, of course, when you point out that you can see Polaris from the Southern Hemisphere and that the Southern Hemisphere is actually bigger than the Northern Hemisphere, they say, oh, oh, well, it, it's it's... Uh, a pear-shaped oblate spheroid uh, bulges out under the pole, uh, under the equator. 
yeah, yeah, that's it. And once again, well, show me the pear-shaped oblate spheroid then. Now, all they've got are these clearly fake photoshopped CGI spheres. Not the oblate spheroids, not the pear-shaped spheroids that they tell you about to try and cover up all these refutations that people come up with. But that's what you get. And of course, not only would, on a spinning ball, would everything gradually come towards the center, but also it would just fly off. Anything that's tried to stick to a spherical surface, even if it's not spinning, falls off. They say that there's this magical force called gravity, which allows by um, big masses, by virtue of their big mass alone, to create a force that attracts other smaller masses to it. Okay? Like a magnet? Yeah, but it's not a magnet. It's everything. They say everything has this force. Well, okay. Show me something that's not a magnet that does this. Um, um, no, they can't show you a single thing. They say, well, there's nothing big enough like, until you get to the level of, like, moons and the Earth and the planets and stuff like that. Then stuff is big enough to cause this, this attraction we're talking about that causes the water and you and the buildings and everything to stick to the bottom of this thousand mile per hour spinning ball. But no practical examples of it whatsoever. They, they, they can't show you any mass by virtue of its big mass alone, that causes even a dust bunny or some tiny, tiny small mass to stick to or orbit around it the way that they say gravity causes masses to do to other masses. So really, this gravity theory is just an illusion that they've told you to make you believe that it's possible that the oceans could be curved around a spinning ball like this and that you could be in Australia upside down and experience yourself as right side up and never fall off. These are all just ways to make you stop believing your eyes. It's pseudoscience to remove you from the actual known science for thousands of years, which is that things fall or rise based on their relative density. It has nothing to do with gravity. If something is more dense, then it goes lower. If something is less dense, it just moves higher. If you've got a helium balloon, how come gravity doesn't bring that down to the Earth? Well, because the helium is lighter than the oxygen and nitrogen and other elements in the air around it, so it naturally rises. Oh, but then you hold a rock and let it go, and the gravity is what causes the rock to drop, right? No, it's the relative density. The rock is denser than the air, so it falls. That's it. You've been taught a stupid science that tells you that gravity, this big G, that you know, the G and the Freemason symbol, all these Freemasons are telling you, gravity is their god. That's what the G is. Their gravity is what created the Big Bang. Not God, gravity. Gravity somehow made everything just explode and then turn into spinning spheres around each other. And then gravity causes the ocean's tides to pull up. And gravity causes you to stick to the, the ball earth. But mosquitoes and bugs and everything can, can escape gravity. Helium balloons can escape it. Think about it. It's what I'm saying. There really is an up and down in nature. Light things go up, heavy things go down. That's it. Gravity is bullshit science to make you believe you're on a spinning ball. Last year, we briefly dis, uh, discussed the EPIC, the, the Earth Polychromatic Imaging Camera and Telescope. You know, that little image that uh, uh, makes NASA feel so, so, so smart. I got to tell you, folks, I think the powers that want to be, they want to have intellectuals. They want to bring them to their colleges and universities, give them PhDs so they can be brought to their silos. What they don't want is renegade inquisitive minds, people who question what they're telling us, like that picture of Epic showing us the Earth from a million miles away. And they, they, they confirm it's an animation featuring actual satellite images. But the question is, once you see that <laughs> laughable moon go along for hours, not a single piece of cloud moves and I'm, I'm sorry, but I just can't believe those quote-unquote intellectuals out there don't question that. Absolutely. And why don't they question that million-mile internet connection that allows us to receive those pictures? Where's the patent for that? <laughs> why, why aren't, why aren't uh, uh, internet service providers using some of that technology? My Wi-Fi cuts out right away. I'm not, not close enough to a hotspot, but they're able to get uh, super 
moon animations from a million miles away. And what is this about them saying that they have to they have to splice the satellite images together and it's actually an animation and all this stuff? It's it's a backpedaling liar. Don't you know a liar when you see one? When you catch out a liar and a lie, do they just go, Ah, oh, yeah, you got me. We don't have million mile internet and it's clearly a bad cartoon. No, they say Oh, well, it is our satellite imaging, but you see, the way that we receive the technology from the imaging from the million mile internet, we have to splice it together and it looks like a sad animation. Believe us. <laughs> smart talk. Yes. Exactly. It, it's all smart talk. And even, you know, I drive three, four hours in the desert coming to where I am now in Mexico and I lose cellular communication for about three hours. And I'm thinking in the 21st century, when we have quote-unquote probes, leaving our solar system and transmitting almost at the speed of light to us. Yet I'm here in the desert, and I cannot get cellular signal. But anyway, I was telling you offline that we, we took a uh, sunset cruise a couple of days ago. And in the sunset, I've mentioned this before, how from my house I can see 80 miles away uh, the coast of Baja. Baja, California. So I went to the captain. I was holding some binoculars and I asked the captain, hey, captain, can you tell me what that is that we can see only now in the afternoon because you can't see it during the day? And he said, oh, sure. That's uh, the tip, the tip of Baja. And I said, really? You think that's just the tip? Why don't you look through these binoculars? And he couldn't believe it. He saw from the bottom of the, the bottom that meets the, the sea all the way to the top. And he looked at me and he couldn't explain it. I just love to see their faces when these people who you know, are navigators and so on, all of a sudden are confronted with something they had no idea was in front of their faces. Absolutely. It's the same thing as the, uh, the ship disappearing over the horizon. You can bring these cityscapes that are supposedly uh, refractions of light, like the Chicago skyline that made a big stir 60 miles away. Oh, it's just light being refracted. Well, use the binoculars and you can see all the way to the base of the buildings. Again, this is an artifact of perspective that the things closest to the horizon disappear before the things farthest away. So the hull of a ship dis uh, going away from you disappears before the masthead. But by using binoculars, it comes fully back into view. Just like a person walking away from you, their shoes and their ankles and then their knees and the rest of their legs are going to disappear before their head does. But that doesn't mean that they're walking over the curvature of a ball earth. And you can prove that it's not the case with binoculars, telescope, or zoom camera and bring the entirety of their legs or the bottoms of the boats or the bottoms of the cities all the way back into view. And then, yeah, watch the faces of the people that thought they were going to get just the tip. Are you telling me that the Chicago skyline was not a mirage? It wasn't. They're lying to you, Mel. <laughs> You know, and people don't question if it's a mirage, what is it really reflect? Uh, where's the reflection? Where's the mirror? I mean, I, you can see in the desert from far away, you see mirage, you think it's water, but that's, that's just the heat rising from the bottom of the, of the hot pavement. But to see in the distance, the top of the Sears Tower and call it a mirage, you know, honestly, these people think that RQ is just the, the one of a lettuce. <laughs> well, and people will say, well, why can't I then see the top of Mount Everest then from That's where right. I am? Yeah. Well, we, cause we've been taught that our eyesight is infinite. We've been taught that the closest star is 25 trillion miles away and the light comes from, you know, 4.2 light years away from us. It has to take that much time just to reach our eyes. So we've been taught that our eyesight, especially with the aid of technology, should be able to see infinite distances. But again, you've been lied to. The stars are not that far away. You can zoom in on them with a P983 times zoom camera and they are right in your face looking like a prismatic, constantly changing disco ball of watery electricity. And that's what even the so-called planets look like. The, the so-called planets were always called wandering stars because they have more unique paths that they wander in the sky than the fixed stars. But when looked at through these instruments, they just look like lights in the sky. They, they do not at all look like spherical terra firma that you could land some masons on, as they'd like you to believe. Um, and so when people ask you, why can't I see Everest from my balcony then? Again, 
perspective and the limited eyesight, even with a telescope, only allows us to see so far. The, the Earth is flat, but it's not completely flat. There's valleys, there's mountains, and you can only see so far for the converging skyline and the uprising ground meet on that horizon. Using a telescope zooms it in and you're able to see a bit further, but thanks to the atmosphere and just the, the limits of our perspective and based on your altitude, you can get, you can see a lot further. Like if you take a balloon up, uh, 20 miles is about as high as we can get an amateur balloon. You can see for hundreds of miles. Again, because of altitude and perspective, not because you're somehow seeing over the curve of the ball, because you're not. Because you can see in those high altitude videos that the horizon has risen 20 miles up to your eye level. Again, impossible on a ball, no matter how big the ball is. And it's flat, 360 degrees around. So you're not just seeing hundreds of miles now because you're seeing over the curvature of the ball. No, your perspective is now greater because you've attained a higher altitude. And if you have a telescope from that altitude, maybe you could see Mount Everest. Nobody's actually tried that experiment. But uh, as far as, you know, seeing the Antarctic ice wall from your balcony, no, I mean, our, our eyesight is limited, and you've been lied to about how far light can travel. It can't travel trillions and trillions of miles, and the stars aren't that far away anyway. Plus, you have plenty of dust particles that prevent you to, from seeing so far away anyway. But, you know, I saw somebody ask the other day, so where did John Glenn go on February 20th, 1962? What is the flat Earth explanation? Where do you think he went? Uh, we know he orbited the Earth. And this has been well documented. So does that prove anything? The fact that you're saying well documented and, uh, you know, th these theories that they call 100% correct, can they prove it? Just, can we really prove anything beyond our planet if we can replicate an experiment in a control environment? It's just like we know the steel recovered from the World Trade Center was shipped to China. You know, of course, there was nothing there. Those towers dustified. But... The lie was repeated so much that I even believed it. And even when I had Dr. Judy Wood on the show, and I said, what about the uh, the steel that was shipped to China? You're like, yeah, that's something I was told and I believed. This is what the media told. It, this doesn't make it a fact. Right, exactly. The, the actual physical evidence, they're always short on that stuff. When you ask NASA, hey, how about the telemetry data from the supposed rocket that and shuttle that took you to the moon and back? Could we see the reels and reels of that? Oh, we lost it. Oh, that's too bad. How about the original moon landing footage? Could you show us the original tape so we can verify their authenticity, this $30 billion project you did 45 years ago and came back with really terrible black and white ghostly images of a recording of a recording that you forced the news agencies to do? Could we see the original that nobody has ever seen? Uh, sorry, we lost that too. Oh, you lost that too. Oh, hey, we killed Osama bin Laden. Really? Can we see the body of that guy? You've been, been traipsing through Iraq and Afghanistan, causing all these wars. Can, can we see the body? Uh, we dumped it in the ocean. Sorry. They're really short on physical evidence. Because when you're creating a bullshit story, you can't have physical evidence, can you? You can only have so-called evidence. You can only have the fabrications of evidence. That's why when you look at evolution theory, the so-called monkey and humanoid transitionary forms or dinosaurs and the supposed physical evidence that they give you for that, oh, uh, actual dinosaur bones? Well, the, the actual dinosaur bones, we keep those under a lock and key that no one in the public can ever or has ever seen. And instead, we give you plaster of Paris molds that we assure you come from the original bones that you've never seen, but they, they are there. And as for Lucy and uh, this Neanderthal man and all these other supposed transitional species, yeah, sorry about that, but it's just human bones mixed with ape bones and... We've been doing this for 150 years now, being exposed regularly, but we just keep doing it. And the great lie, if you just keep telling the same lie over and over again, even if all the physical evidence has been exposed as nonsense, they'll start to believe it just by the sheer weight of the propaganda. 
So as a truth seeker, I recommend people ask these questions and look for the physical evidence. Look for, you know, oh, aliens. Oh, yeah, show me show me physical evidence of an alien. Still nothing. How many type of aliens? We must have millions and millions and millions of hits and people contacting aliens and all this stuff. Physical evidence, please? None. Okay. These kind of things are where you have to look. And that's where the flat earth is. It has reams of physical evidence. My latest book is 200 Proofs the Earth is Not a Spinning Ball. That's just, I came up with 200 uh, because William Carpenter came up with 100 back in the 1800s and I wanted to double it. Somebody else could double mine. It's, it, when you're when you're dealing with the truth, you can come up with as many proofs and experiments and evidence as you want, and that's what you're going to find for the flat, motionless Earth. And again, this is why they don't want you using this method of discernment. They want to keep you in la la land, based on testimonials and hearsay. They don't want you to, doing actual science, looking for actual physical proof of things, because that's when you really start to get to the bottom of these hoaxes. <laughs> I'm just laughing because I've said it many times for years that my wife is in a totally different wavelength than me when it comes to all of this. Like the captain the other day, when I, when I asked him the question, she knew why I was asking. She was rolling her eyes or we went in, you know, a few months after we did our interview and we discussed a little bit of the dinosaurs, which I'd like to discuss more later. But uh, we went to the Museum of, Museum of Natural Natural History in New York back in October or November. And uh, my wife and my daughter went with me and I asked two curators in front of them. And I said, are there, because they have a bunch of dinosaurs, they're huge, the size of buildings, right? So I went to them and I said, are there any real ones here? Any of the bones real? And my wife was like, how dare you ask that question? They are real. Look at them. And both of them said, no, sir, those are, as you say, plaster. And I said, what's the reason? Why can't you just, oh, because of the elements and we don't want people talking, you know, touching them, even though they have, you know, ropes around them, you can't touch them. But just to avoid the, you know, the, the historical value, we need to put them away somewhere. And I'm thinking, where the hell do you have these huge bones? Where's the warehouse? I like to go see. So do they have real bones somewhere? <laughs> no, I mean, even uh, long-time paleontology students have come out saying that they're, they're trying to get a glimpse of these, but because they were critical of the establishment, they aren't allowed to see them either. Basically, it seems like unless you're indoctrinated enough or unless you've been brought into the secret societies and told the truth anyway, that you're not going to get into the higher echelons of this kind of stuff anyway. So, you know, people like Neil deGrasse Tyson, he knows the earth is flat and motionless. He's a Freemason and he's doing a job, an acting job, where he propagates this deception onto you guys. And the, the high level dinosaur people, it's the same thing. They know that dinosaurs don't exist, but the bones, the supposedly the real bones are kept locked away, but they just give you plaster repair. If there were real bones, you could put them behind, uh, you know, solid, bulletproof glass, whatever, whatever you want, but show us the real thing. No, 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 they can't do that. But they, they show didn't. us petrified wood. I mean, the mo uh, <laughs> lunar rocks. That's right, which have now come out to uh, be fake, right? These these moon rocks that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin gave to museums around the world have now been scrutinized and found to be just petrified wood that they've dug up somewhere. So, yeah, the, the, these things, they've been exposed as complete hoaxes, but the public is still being duped by things like museum displays of fake bones and whatnot to, to make us believe that we evolved from giant reptiles. So, so what dinosaurs do for the evolutionists is they provide the stepping stone from lizards and fish and non-flying things to flying lizards and and then uh, reptiles turning into mammals. See, they've got these links in the supposed evolutionary chain that they don't have fake answers for, so they've had to come up with them along the way. And so, you know, they say that the Big Bang happened and nothing came, uh, everything came from nothing for no reason due to gravity, their God. And then all of this, this explosion, which, you know, unlike most explosions, which destroy things, 
this explosion created things. It created everything somehow out of nothing. So it's a creationary explosion. And then all this debris, which came out of nowhere, nothing. And now what is this debris? What is it? Well, it's uh, the, the lighter elements, I guess. Hydrogen, helium, okay, whatever. And then somehow they become greater elements and, and bigger, heavier elements. And they start spinning around and they become these planetoids, lifeless. Oh, but then somehow water forms, you know, the, the elements come together and somehow with an intricate, uh, you know, meandering of these elements, consciousness and life and intelligence somehow comes into play. Oh, and now there's living, living organisms and then somehow they reproduce. Oh, there was two of them and they had sex somehow. They, they just simultaneously manifested, I guess, and now sexual reproduction started happening and then the species started changing. They started and, and they had two males that reproduce. How is that? Right. How did, how was there two of anything? How was there one of anything? They can't explain that, but they just skip over that in one sentence in your textbook and hope that you don't ask questions. Oh, and okay. So then it's multicellular organisms and then it's, it's, uh, you know, the, a fish say in the water somehow. Okay. Now we're up to fish now. And then the fish somehow crawl up onto land and they don't die like every fish you've ever seen that jumps out of the water. Somehow it lives. It transitions its gills into lungs. It mates somehow. The, the offspring live and then the offspring have magically mutated into air breathing, uh, fish like amphibians now. And then the amphibians turn into reptiles and then, then we gotta get them flying. Okay. That's where the dinosaurs start coming in. We got a flying pterodon, pterod, pterodactyl terrorist. We like that word, terra. Terra means earth, the earth that we lie about. So it's a, it's a flying dinosaur. And then they got dinosaurs that supposedly had feathers that they're trying to convince you of. Feathers that fossilized 65 million years ago. And now we have proof that dinosaurs, uh, were the evolutionary link to feathered birds. Again, these have been exposed as hoaxes if you look into them. I won't get into it here. But then suddenly a meteorite comes. And what does the meteorite do besides reinforcing their bullshit spinning ball infinite universe? It does away with all of these supposed dinosaurs yeah. that existed. And uh, cockroaches and frogs and other lizards and all the other stuff that's still alive today. Those were able to survive the meteor. Um, but somehow all those, those big, giant, ridiculous lizards that would topple under their own weight and whose bones couldn't possibly support their massive structures, those, those all went away. Except for some bones, which paleontologists find, not normal people, not everyday people tripping over them for thousands and thousands of years, but just interested parties for the past 150 years, the first dinosaur bone discovered shortly after the idea of evolution was introduced. So it's just a convenient, the, these supposed transitional forms, dinosaurs, the ape man, human, human man, all this stuff. This is just what they need to make their evolution idea seem plausible. And they fabricate the supposed evidence for you to make you believe in it. But when you look into the actual physical evidence that exists for these supposed transitional forms or the history of the adaptation of species, have there ever been a species that turns into another species? Macro evolution? No, it's never happened. They have no proof of it. Micro evolution, minor adaptations within species? Sure. But this is what they're trying to turn into uh, macro evolution of Everything that exists evolving from everything else that did exist evolving from nothing and a big bang. So they get you to believe that the, the amazing connectivity, beauty, diversity of nature and the natural world, the intelligence, everything around you somehow came from nothing for no reason and out of an explosion that created it. And then it just like evolved for no reason to have consciousness, life and intelligence and have all this order and beauty and diversity that we have just by coincidence it's random yeah it just happened so what does this do it's a nihilistic atheistic cosmology that makes you a speck of dust it makes god irrelevant it makes him impossible it makes you a purposeless meaningless accident of an explosion that just happened to be now so what do you, how would you live how, how would you live your life when you believe that kind of cosmology. Well, it's all about me. 
right? Nothing really matters. So I might as well just have a good time, do what, what I want with my life, uh, consume, consume, you know, just, which is exactly the way society is set up and the way that the people who control society and who have fed you this myth for centuries anyway, that, that's what they want. And that's why you behave this way and think this way. And that's why you scoff at people that know that they were intelligently designed by an intelligent designer. That's why you scoff at people that know that we're on a flat, motionless earth. And you laugh, your hearty, spinning ball earther laugh, where you think that you know something because you've seen CGI pictures and you believe that that guy, Neil deGrasse Holt Tyson. And I tell people, because they say, Mel, so if you're not religious, then it means you're an atheist. And abs the answer is absolutely not. I have never been an atheist. And yes, I abandoned organized religion a long time ago because I don't think that I should have a toll booth on my path to enlightenment. But essentially, what Eric is saying is the equivalent of me throwing a chalk on a blackboard and expecting the word God to show up. I think there's, that's more probable than what they're saying. But by looking at the species, by looking at consciousness, by looking at everything that surrounds us, to come from an explosion, I just still cannot get it. So, yes, I think they're trying to get us to believe that we are insignificant, utter, dumb slaves that have no hope so that we can just go to work eight to five paradigm and just be too occupied to ask questions. But I have a question. How, probably half an, hour, half an hour away from me here, there's something called the Pinacatic Crater. And it's uh, by UNESCO. They consider it as important as Machu Picchu in Peru. Not a lot of people know this, but this is the crater by, let's call it whatever, a meteor or whatever crashed on it, where the Apollo 11 astronauts practiced before going to the moon. These craters are what they, what look to be like craters. What are they then? Yeah. So there's things that they call craters, which are holes in the earth like a bowl shape and right. then there's little edges kind of up up above the the rest of the the earth around them there so in one way it looks like it could have been caused based on an impact from above though another way it could be is say like a gas bubble from below and that same kind of shape could be the resulting uh shape from some sort of phenomenon happening from below just as well. Like a sinkhole. A, like a sinkhole. Um, and if it was from, say, a rock, burning rock from outer space, there should be huge, I mean, the, the rock itself should still be there if it caused that big of a depression. And there should also be uh, huge chunks of it everywhere. Yet none of these supposed crater sites have anything of the sort. Uh, you know, no big ball sitting in a hole or even gigantic shards that we can still look at only again little little pieces that they claim oh this is a meteorite just like they claim the the moon rocks and same with the craters on the moon if you look at the moon with your own eyes or with a telescope there are potch marks of some kind there but it's a foregone conclusion to say that they are craters uh formed during meteorite collisions i mean this is just uh, an explanation that you've come up with is a possible explanation, but there's no physical evidence for that. None of us have ever seen a rock come from space and collide with the Earth, make a huge explosion, and then show us the rock sitting there so that we can verify that, yep, that was a big-ass rock that just came from outer space. It doesn't exist. We don't actually have that physical evidence to prove that such a thing exists. So what do we see around the world? These lights that we saw in Russia a few years back and Arizona a few weeks ago, what are these? Well, we've got shooting stars. Like I said, stars aren't actual terra firma. So when you see a light shoot from somewhere to somewhere else, it's simply that. It's simply a light shooting. It's, it's not a rock in outer space coming somewhere. No, no, but the ones in Russia that actually broke school windows and, and it, it, it almost felt like a, an explosion. Right. And then you've got these ones where you can see from, mostly from Russia, it seems like, from dashboard cams, you'll see right, these right. Bur burning balls of something coming. And yeah, the, they've, they've even uh, cr crashed windows and something. These, I think, are some sort of military thing that they're shooting to make us believe that meteorites exist uh, because they're always coming down at an angle 
like they've been shot from a plane. If meteorites existed and we were on a spinning ball Earth, then meteors should be shooting in every single direction possible, not always from the exact same direction coming down onto the Earth. There should be meteorites that go upwards and ones that go diagonally upwards and ones that go horizontal and, and every other type of way, but we don't see that. So I'm quite skeptical of meteorites or asteroids or any sort of thing that they claim is up there floating around and comes down here and destroys dinosaurs, their other myth. <laughs> they like to use their myths in conjunction like that. Two more um, questions. So, no, I'm sorry, finish your statement. It is. Uh, so as far as the, the Russian ones, I, I would tend to think those are some sort of military experiment, uh, some sort of weapon or something like this, because um, you, you don't see them all over the world. You just see them there. It seems like it might be something they're working on. Um, and the craters, not sure what those are formed from, but again, not seeing the evidence that they're from rocks falling from the sky and for shooting stars. Uh, they say that those are comets or, or, or that's another one. They say comets or whatever are, are asteroid rock formations that circle around us every so many years. But if we're spinning around the sun and the sun spinning around the galaxy and all these motions are happening, why would comets have regular, uh, revolutions that we would see in such a cosmology? If the earth was actually making all of those motions, we shouldn't ever come up across the same comets again. That makes more sense in a geocentric cosmology where everything in the heavens is revolving around us so that it could return at a regular time, like Halley's Comet or something like that. What about the Tunguska event in 1908 in, in Russia? What do you think caused that? Was that, was that the supposed teleport? No, that was the Philadelphia experience. What's <laughs> yeah, the Tunguska one? <laughs> it's, a, it's an event. It was a large explosion that occurred near the... Uh, uh, the uh, Tunguska River, and he basically burned hundreds and hundreds of acres of forest there. And people, as far as England, saw the light. Uh, no, I haven't looked into that one. I'm not sure about that. That's fine. And just two more items before we take a quick break. Uh, recently, you probably have seen these images of the Mars. Somebody pointed me into this. The Mars rover in Greenland. Google images showing, you know, how do we know? First of all, you know, there may be, if Mars really exists, there may be some rovers there. But now that I saw these images of rovers in Greenland looking just like Mars, how do we know that these rovers are, in fact, not in somewhere in a desert in California or Greenland or somewhere else on Earth? Exactly. Yeah, the, the Martian landscape looks incredibly like the hills of Arizona or Australia right. or... Or Ireland. Yeah, and uh, if you just remove the red tint that's been added to these pictures in Photoshop, you'll see it looks exactly like the Earth. And it's just been after effects to make it look kind of alien, you know, as they do. Um, but yeah, the, the, all the Mars rover shots, I mean, some of them are just straight up animations. They're not even, they're not even video. The, the video are all filmed here on Earth, just like the moon supposed uh, landings, you can see that they use the exact same backgrounds over and over and over again on the different missions and on the same missions where they say that, oh, today we're five miles from where we were yesterday. And then you line up the, the mountains and the hills in the background and they match exactly. They inter, they overlay perfectly showing that they're in a relatively small studio having to use the same backdrops over and over again, but shooting them from different angles and from different distances to try and give the illusion that they've covered uh, great distances on the moon. But again, with your third eye and a little bit of physical evidence, putting them next to each other, the angles, ups and downs of the mountains and hills f trace each other exactly. Just like the gravity on the moon, which is supposedly one-sixth of the fake gravity here on Earth, causing the astronauts to move in that slow, floaty type of way. When you speed the footage up to two times, you see that they're in regular, normal atmosphere, gravity, whatever you want to call it, and they're just bouncing along or in their little buggy going along, kicking up dust at the exact same rate it would here on Earth. They've just slowed it down in post-production to make you think it's more alien again, just like the red tint in the Martian photos. So it's all Hollywood stuff. 
you know, this Martian, they're going to send someone to Mars. They found water on Mars. There's a pyramid on Mars. There's a face on Mars. Yeah, a Photoshop face. Yeah, Photoshop pyramids. Yeah, Richard Hoagland goes on CNN, and you believe it because it's some supposed NASA insider exposing it, right? Yeah. That's that's the way to get the propaganda to really sink in. You you give these whistleblowers to come out, and you make them into heroes that are are exposing this this information that only they have on the inside, right? And that's what us us conspiracy theorists love. With oh, we love a good whistleblower, and we think that that is actual truth and proof. But this is what I'm saying. This is the kind of evidence that we need to move away from. That's hearsay. When you have some supposed expert coming out and giving you information that only he has and that only he can confirm, that's called hearsay. It doesn't matter how much of an expert he is. We need physical, tangible evidence, stuff that you can put your hands on and prove. And again, that's why these kind of pundits, these kind of uh, whistleblower, insider conspiracy guru types uh, don't want the flat earth truth coming out because then you can prove for yourself that their claims are nonsense and you know the cat's out of the bag the, the flat earth is the cat getting out of the bag and they really don't want this one to get out that's why the subject is so full of shills and trolls and nonsense like the flat earth society and another fake flat earthers that come in and give fake arguments and give fake flat earth facts to make the the idea of flat earth seem impalatable to people and to seem ridiculous so they don't want to discuss it and research it and to think like you said that it's irrelevant what does it matter what the shape of the earth is anyway as you've been listening to us talking for the past hour you can see how it's very relevant and how there's a huge myth of what you and what and who we all are interwoven into this and when that is brought down. This whole myth is brought down, and there's a, a whole new worldview that comes clearly into view, which shows that you were purposefully, intelligently created to be this way, as was the whole earth. And it's obvious. You've been blinded from that obvious truth to think some nonsense that nothing, everything could come from nothing for no reason and create everything that you see before you. You've closed your eyes to reality and opened your ears to Freemasons. That's it. That's all that's happened. And when I think of Lenin, I think of his quote, the best way to control the opposition is to lead it ourselves. So even with, I keep I keep uh, putting the metaphor of the, the comparison with 9-11, you see on TV, you see certain people that come on TV, the mainstream media, to discuss how there was a demolition that day or blah, blah, blah. There are certain control oppositions that are allowed to speak to really, truly derail you. But the real ones, like the work of Dr. Judy Wood, you'll never see her on the mainstream media because that is the scientific work of somebody with double, triple PhDs, with mechanical engineering, with interferometry. That is somebody who you want to analyze what happened. Everybody says, I want a new forensic investigation. Well, she already did it, but nobody wants to listen. So one last point before we take the break. This is Eric from the Daily Mail. On October 13, 2015, a China Airlines flight landed in Anchorage, Alaska, with an extra passenger after an expectant mother gave birth to a baby girl more than eight weeks early. The Bali to Los Angeles flight was forced to make an emergency landing on Thursday after a Taiwanese passenger's water broke six hours into the 19-hour journey. So, folks, get out your globe, and you will see that there is no way that Anchorage, Alaska, was anywhere near the route of the flight, which could have just easily continued its path to straight to Los Angeles or landed in Honolulu. However, on the flat Earth map, the same one that matches the UN flag, Anchorage, Alaska, is very near the route. And I'll take your comments on the other side, and we have so much more to discuss, including the dinosaur hoax. Eric, how can people buy your books, learn more about your work? Uh, come to my website, atlanteanconspiracy.com or the International Flat Earth Research Society Forum at ifers.ace.st. Uh, my books are available on lulu.com as well as Amazon and most other uh, major providers. Um, yeah, you should be able to find everything. Uh, links from all those three sites. Great, folks, don't go anywhere. Eric Dubay, directly from Bangkok, Thailand, will be back with us for another hour. This is Mel Fabregas, and you're listening to Veritas. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> 